verse 7 of 1 Peter chapter 4. This is where we looked last week. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so, do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's go to our God. Father, we come before you and we do realize there's a torn veil and we enter in with boldness and confidence, fully uh, accepted uh, sins forgiven because you did not forgive your own son. You poured out justice, your wrath upon him so that now we could receive the full mercy of God. You have wrapped us in your perfect righteousness. God, we stand before you loved and accepted, <laughs> adopted. We rejoice in these great truths. And I pray this morning now, Lord, we want to respond to these truths we, we want to live in light of them, and I just thank you for this word that will direct us and show us the right response to free sovereign grace. So please, Lord, uh, attend this word by your spirit, help us to understand it, and then get it into our affections and change our wills to be these kind of men, women, and children. So we ask you to do what no human can do. We look to you as we begin, sovereign God, do your work in the midst of Southside Bible Church this morning. Let us worship you now through the word of God. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We're learning about a suffering church that Peter's writing to. His letter is broken up in this first section of salvation, that we're to have a, a love and a desire for it, to understand it, to, to just get it into our souls. Then he has been looking at the setting, the setting of this church that he's writing to that's been spread and scattered because of persecution. And he's telling us as we live in the middle of this, we're to live in such a way, uh, in a righteous way, a way to show them Jesus Christ, to show them his kingdom. And there'll be persecution that will come and people are going to be saved by our testimony of those who have a hope past this life. And that's this next section we've moved into is the second coming, 4-7 through 5-11, that our hope is anchored on a soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ to establish his eternal kingdom. So as I thought about this some more, I would add a little more to kind of this broad outline. Salvation is that we're to look back to it with faith. We're to look back at what God accomplished in Jesus Christ the setting now as we're learning is we're to go forward in love. We now live in this setting that's before us and we're to be a people who manifest and show the love of God to each other and to this world. Then there's a second coming that we look forward to. We look forward in hope. Uh, there's an imminence to the return of Christ. Could today be the day? My whole hope is anchored on the, the, the invisible Lord ma making himself visible and returning to this earth. That is where I live. That's where I set my hope. And so what, what did Paul say is the greatest of these, though? He said in Corinthians that the greatest of these is love. The other two are going to reach their fulfillment. Faith is going to become sight. Hope is going to become reality. But heaven is going to be this love manifested perfectly for all of eternity. It will not go away. It's just going to get deeper, infinite, perfect. That's where all this is moving. And so let's take up what we introduced last week. If you'll look with me in verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. The end is coming. This is the hope of the church. This is our finish line. This is the consummation, the fulfillment, the goal of history. It's at hand. It's coming. It's going to reach its fulfillment. And so we're not to get lost here then in the scene. We're not to get lost and try to make Denver our paradise, to try to figure out that, that this life I live now, I'm going to keep learning and getting security and make this my home and this be my hope. Our hope is not the scene, 
but our hope is in the soon return of our bridegroom. Oh, come, Lord Jesus Christ. So what is this hope to do to the people of God? What are we to do with this hope? Are we to spend our days in eschatology debates and figure out all the signs? What are they going to be? And and listen to the news and figure out what's the mark of the beast? Who's the antichrist right now in this world? Is 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 this what this is to produce a soon return? Is it to sit on your rooftops in your pajamas and be done doing anything and just wait? Is it to say my retirement is the second coming? What should this do to the people of God? Well, the short answer is it's to make us a people of hope. It's a people who've been born again to a living hope, and we are people just filled with hope of the return of Jesus Christ. The key to this section for me, once again, is the therefore in verse 7. I just love therefores. They're, They're so pregnant with meaning. The whole Christian life is built on them. They're beautiful. Love them. Just drink them up. (laughs) Therefore, I just think I'm going to make a t-shirt maybe that says therefore. Wouldn't you love that? I I know people are going to say, what's that? What does that mean? And you're in the gospel. Here it is. This is what it's there for. Because the therefore is the difference between religion and morality and cults and the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a therefore, there's a gospel that all of our lives are lived out of that reality and into that reality. And so what is it therefore? It says because his coming is near, therefore that truth is to guide our thinking and our behavior in these days. There's something that anchors our life. There's a therefore. He's coming, and it's soon, and it's imminent, and he's going to consummate all things. Therefore, last Sunday we saw the imperatives that need to be done by us in light of this second coming of Jesus Christ. Be of sound judgment. Be of sound judgment. Thinking with the mind of Christ. Letting the word of God dwell in you richly, that you're biblene, you're thinking the thoughts, God's thoughts toward your life, himself, how he's going to unfold history. We're, we're, to, we're to have sound judgment. Think God's thoughts about life and, and, and everything surrounding us. And then to be sober in spirit. To be sober, this word carries the idea of moderation. And it's not moderation with alcohol, but it's a spiritual moderation. It's a moderation in the world that we're not to be drinking up the things of the world and be drunk towards the things of God and and to just be so taken in the world more and more and all these different things that I'm just drunk to my blessed hope, Jesus Christ, come back. I'm going to get spiritually drowsy and cold and sleepy. I was thinking of uh, one day I was standing here doing a wedding uh, with Nick Decker. And the reason I bring him up is I've done a lot of weddings, but my neck never hurt more than at the end of this one because the, 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 the song started and those doors opened and his bride was there and he started squeezing my neck so hard I thought it was going to break. <laughs> And the the look on that guy's face was priceless. It's just, boom, there's my bride. And I just thought, you know, what if I would have said, Nick, straighten your tie up a little bit, son. It's not quite straight. Nick, what did did you eat for breakfast? Uh, You know, if I would have started asking him the questions of this world, what movies are you going to see next week? You would say, that's idiotic. This guy is so sober because all he can think about is this bride, That's all, if I'd have brought up anything else in that moment, he would have laughed at me. And that's what this is saying. There's a soon return of Christ. Quit being all about all these other things and taking them in and drinking them up and and get focused on this one thing. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Come, Lord Jesus. We should be that way, single-minded, sober focus on the marriage supper of the Lamb. God, get my eyes set and focused and fixed on this blessed hope. And the reason being, in verse 7, is for the purpose of prayer. And what I like about this prayer is it's, it's not a verb. It's a noun. And so we're, we're to be not just doing prayer, but this is what we are. We're, we're a people who 
who commune with God and we look to him for everything. We pray, I don't have my own strength. Apart from him, I can do nothing. I'm sober-minded and I get all this and I, I, therefore I'm just praying in light of that and in those realities and in my moderations and trying to live a faithful Christian life against epithumias and all these battles. And so the, there is to be the focus prayer. We're praying ones. And so this morning... The force of that, therefore, is going to carry us to the next commands and the participles, modifying verse 7. And I want you to look with me then in verse 8. Above all then, here's kind of this imperatile force. Keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. And so the end of all things is that near. Uh, It's very near, and so it's vertical. Keep your mind and your spirit on what matters and be a praying one who lives in communion with God, dependent on God, looking to Him for all things. But now there's something horizontal. There's something that is essential to us in these end days as well. And I like the phrase, above all. Above all, we, we need a love. We, we need an agape toward one another that covers sins, It's the body of Christ and the manifestation then of that love to each other and to the world. Above all, we need each other to make it to the end then in fervent love. It's it's coming, it's at the end, and, and, and what do we need? Well, you need above all fervent love for one another. The end times are gonna get very, very hard, really hard, and pressures and opposition and hatred are increasing all around us. Worldliness will increase Jesus himself said most people's love will grow cold if those days are not cut short. Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe that these days are going to be that numbing and they're going to become that hard that you can uh, become a lone ranger Christianity and a coldness in your love? Do Do you believe what Jesus is saying to you? The only one who doesn't need, uh, you're, you're the only person on the earth right now who doesn't need to fear a declining love in the end days. There's almost a haughtiness and an overconfidence. Uh, I don't need to worry about this. Your heart is prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We are prone to make Denver our paradise. We have a, a, a flesh, remaining flesh, that is inclined towards all of these things. And in the end days, it's going to give it feed and uh, sunshine and soil to, to prosper and blossom selfishness and a lack of love. That's what the end days are going to become. Do you guys remember who's writing this letter? It's Peter. What did Jesus say to Peter? Peter, before the rooster crows this night, you're going to betray me three times. What was his answer? No way. Even if all of these other apostles fall away, I will not. There's nothing like that in my own heart. I love you with a hot, red, white, hot love, Jesus. My my love will never fail. And of course, what happened to Peter? The proud denial of the three Three denials, the proud owner of three denials. And now Jesus tells us in the end days that most people's love will grow cold. And so we hear those words and we say, yeah, those weaker Christians, those with kind of uh, not sound doctrine and all these different areas, they're going to struggle in the end times, but never me. You're making the exact same mistake that Peter made. You're not taking the words of Christ to heart. These words were spoken about us because the end is at hand. We just read that. We live in the end days. The next step, we're praying for the return of Christ. And so Peter's telling us as one who knows his very own heart, his very heart, therefore, get your mind and your spirit in line and pray and don't fall asleep like I did when I was praying for Jesus. And get in the body and love and be hospitable, and use your gifts, he says, to build each other up. We need our gifts. You you have to keep your love aflame, that though you do not see him, you love him. You love Jesus Christ. You love him so much, your hope is set on the soon return of the bridegroom. I can't live without you any longer. Come, Lord Jesus, you're my love. You're that bride ready. I want you to come down the aisle. Come, return, Jesus Christ. I beg you. 
with all the love that I have in my heart, then don't be the virgin in Christ's parable that did not have oil in their lamp when he returned. They weren't ready. He said they were drowsy and sleeping, and they were drunk with this world. Get in the body the way that Peter and God are calling you to here in this section. The end times are at at hand. Get in the body of Christ. You're going to need them if you're going to make it through these hard days that are coming upon us. Lone rangers aren't going to finish. We need to pray for repentance if we have lost this vision and this focus and have, and have taken on the American way of I don't need anyone but me and I've isolated and I've pulled away and I, I just, I'm out of the body of Christ. This is a call for the end days behavior of the body of Christ. Plug in, repent if you've become cold toward the body of Christ and engaging it. And we're going to be looking at love, and then we're going to look at hospitality, and then we're going to look at using our gifts. Peter is so concerned about those for our lives. And so one last thought maybe before we begin. We're, we're going to start eventually, guys, I promise. This jumped out at me this week as well, is, is Peter's going to tell us, above all, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, and just thinking is these passages, they're jumping off at me. Whenever the New Testament writers start to deal with body life and its importance, they start every time with the foundation being love. It's always the foundation to the kind of life that we're to live together. While we are waiting for his return, this is always their foundation. It's the heart and motive that all of our actions then together are to follow. And so I want to just hit a couple quickly. Romans 12, 11 chapters of doctrine. The gospel, therefore, offer up your body as a living sacrifice. And now we're going to start talking about the church and, and how we live together. So how do we live? Romans 12, 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Let, let your love be pure and real, and not phony. Don't bring phony, fake love into the church. Love you, brother. Pray for you, and no, I won't. And I really don't care about you. Don't bring that into the church. Have a love that is not hypocritical. He says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Then give preference. Be diligent. Be fervent. Serve. Persevere. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep and associate with the lowly. All of that's going to flow out of a genuine love that has a therefore out of the gospel of the first 11 chapters of Romans. 1 Corinthians 13, of course, the body life was not matching with the gospel and their gifts, they're being selfish and they're being showy. They want the flashy gifts. And, and Paul, of course, drives them to say, look for the greatest one of love. Without love, you're a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. Uh, to exercise your gifts, they're going to begin here with love. And once you have love, your gifts aren't just to be showy. <laughs> your gifts are in love to build up the body of Christ. Galatians says, get the gospel right, and then you can have grace and sanctification, and it's all faith working through love. And Galatians 5, 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Ephesians 4.1, uh, Rick was reading, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Walk worthy of this gospel with humility and gentleness and patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Philippians 2, he talks about to have this love that flows out of the gospel in humility. And so guys, it just goes on and on and on. Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? To love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, your neighbor as yourself, and upon these things hangs the whole law. So so it just, this is it. This is it, above all. Above all, why, why do I take the time to keep showing you this? 
It's so that you don't miss it. Our life together is to be bound together by hearts filled with the love that comes only from God. It's called agape. And to have an agape love, the love that that God gives, the love that flows through us unto the world, unto each other. Without it, we're only going to be legalists. And what will come out of this group will only be natural. The best thing we can muster up is a natural kind of affection. It'll function like the world. We're going to love those who are like us, and we're going to walk away from those who aren't like us, from those who hurt us, from those who have a perceived hurt, and we're going to avoid them and stay away. That's a natural love. That's a phony love. It's hypocritical. And we'll just love the beautiful people. And we'll be united by our natural affections and our natural desires. That's the world. That's what brings the world together, but not the body of Christ. It will never be what God wants the church to be, a signpost of heaven when everything's united under Christ and loves him and loves each other. We get to show the world something that they don't have, they can't get, they can't manufacture. You can see it in one place, in the body of Christ. And when they walk in here, they should say, oh, how they love God, and oh, how they love one another, and oh, how they love me. This will never bring us, natural will never bring us to verse 11, that God will be glorified by our lives together. It will not be what God designed the church to be to help us in the last days, when people's love is going to start growing cold. We, we got to get together, and we got we to use the gifts and the power of God's love to keep us red, white, hot love for Jesus Christ and each other and this world that's passing away. We, we're gonna, we can't drift into this coldness that's gonna characterize the end days. I, I would rather die than be cold to Christ and to each other. So consider our current verses that we're looking at. Love is the foundation of our life together. And then from that, we, we get into each other's homes And we bring in strangers and people in the church that we don't even know. And we have hospitality where we need to gather into our homes in intimate settings. And then as we do that, we have gifts that God has given us now to build each other up and to use them so that we'll be growing up into the head. That is it. Then the gospel will go out in power and all men will know that we're his disciples because we have love for one another and we will live the kind of lives that we've been learning about and studying all the way through 1 Peter. Amen? Do you see the progress? It's beautiful what Peter's laying out for us. So let's dig in and see if, see if your love has grown cold. If you've just, maybe you just have the trappings of Christianity, but, but not Christ. You have no true agape. If you spent your life and you've just kept people at arm's length all of your supposed Christian life, If the door of your house only opens with pizza delivery, which is good, I like pizza, um, but bring some brothers and sisters to eat the pizza with you. If your gifts lie dormant and there's no one in your life to use them, these are the issues that have to be answered because the end is at hand. Because if you turn back with me to 1 Peter, actually, go back to chapter 1, verse 22. There's a therefore that started in verse 13 in light of the gospel. And verse 22, since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for what? A sincere love of the brethren. Fervently love one another from the heart. These new, transformed, regenerated hearts. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. So you, you've been born again, and the way you know that you have had a spiritual birth is there's a stretching, fervent love for the brethren. That's what he says. You've been born again, and now the love of God has overwhelmed me in being born again, and I just want to love. It is a new birth. It's in the heart. This is what will come out of you if you've tasted of the kindness of God. So my heart breaks as I just keep growing in this gospel, my heart is beginning to to hurt more and love more than it ever has. When I see someone drifting in the flock, 
It's deeper than ever. It's easier to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice than I ever have in my whole life. When someone is growing and manifesting more of Jesus Christ in this body, it is so easy now for me to just rejoice in the Lord. Opening my house to be an incubator where all those seeds of love grow together and use their gifts to build each other up into Jesus Christ is one of the most joyful things for me to just sit back and watch. We had a prayer time in our community group on Tuesday night, and a bunch of our young people are being afflicted with physical illnesses and diseases that the doctors can't even figure out. And they were just praying for one another. And and the, the prayers were so sweet and so full of love and so full of concern. I just sat there going, God, I could do this all night. I I could stay here all night and just keep praying with these sweet saints. So my point is by the grace of God, this little seed should be growing in every one of our lives. As we keep learning the gospel and growing in it from cover to cover of this Bible, love should be growing and sprouting within us. And so that's what I would ask you is not, do you go to church more? Do you have more commentaries? Has your theology gotten crisper? Is it producing a greater love for God and others. Let's look at verse eight. Above all, above all, as we look to the horizontal, this is Peter's first class concern. This is the one then that we must have. I call this the Mount Everest of Christian virtue. Above all, as I look horizontally now, above every virtue, above them all, I see this one here is to have a fervent love. Peter's mentioned it three times in verse 22 of chapter 1, 217, 38, and now again in 48. Does Peter think we're dense? <laughs> How many times do you got to keep saying this, Peter? And I know this is, it's one of the strings on my banjo, and you guys say, why do you keep playing this song? Because it's God's summary of the whole law, of how he wants us to live. If he is love and we manifest him when we love like this, then it pleases our God. The enemy does not want the true Christ-like love to flow through this body and permeate into the world. This is where he'll have a frontline attack is on love, and what produces that love is the gospel. So the enemy's gonna attack the purity of the gospel, that we get away from it, that we drift from it, and he's gonna attack the way we love one another and get us with divisions and fighting and judging and being critical, and those are the areas the enemy are gonna attack so the church will never be the glory and the beauty of what God has designed us to be showing to this world. So consider what we were in Adam. It was the opposite of this kind of love. The fall has made us a world filled with self-love. And as the enemy is the God of this world, he will lead his followers into his character, which is the love of self. And I want you just one last time, I want you to hear what Paul says it's going to be like in the end days. 2 Timothy 3. Realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. And the difficult times will be this. Men are going to be lovers of self. I don't know a better description of America. Men will be lovers of self. Lovers of money. And he goes through the whole list. And he says they'll they'll be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness. They'll still gather in churches. But they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Avoid those who are going to love pleasure more than God and love themselves more than God. That's going to happen in the end. You're going to have a form of godliness and people are going to talk about their Christianity and all of these things, but there's no power that's producing a love that is coming from God. That's what it's going to look like. This will be the air that we breathe and we need not be conformed to it, but transformed by the renewing of our minds to have love in our hearts and manifest them by deed and by thought into the body. So there's a reason that Peter keeps telling us this. It's not because we're dense, but we're gonna run after a hundred other things and we're gladly gonna leave, we're gonna leave love behind as, oh, that's a given. That's a simple thing. That's too basic, just too basic. Let's get on to bigger and better things, pastor. Well, because of his return is near, Above all, 
Keep fervent in your love for one another. That's not basic. That's the sunum bonum of Christianity. You don't get higher than Mount Everest in your Christian duty than fervent love for each other. So what I would like to do is just draw out some of the ways that Peter wants us to think about this love. It's, it's not exhaustive, but it's the traits that he wants us to consider in, in light of the soon return of Jesus Christ. And the first one I want you to consider with me in verse 8 is just the word for love as agape. He, that agape, again, it begins with God. God is its source. And as this motive moved God to do for us a great good, and saving our souls, and it came at the cost of great harm to his very own son. It's his own son he had to crucify. And so it flows from us now to others, not to the same degree, but the quality. And so we are to do good to others at our own personal cost. Agape looks at an object, I just want to better it, I want to help it, I want it to grow. It isn't what I get out of it. Get out of self-love. I just, I just, God's loved me and I just want to love you. I want you bettered. I want hospitality. I want my gifts to help you grow into Jesus Christ. It isn't about me. That's agape. In the end days, agape. He says, let it be fervent. This word for fervent means to be stretched or strained. We saw it earlier in chapter one. It referred to a horse who's running and straining his muscles or in the Olympic games, you know, back then, they, I forget what kind of games they were, uh, but it was, it was a runner straining every spiritual muscle as it reaches for the finish line. Have you ever seen those runners in a 100-yard dash? It's just stretching every muscle to be the first one to go through that tape. That's the kind of love that we're to have. This is a love that stretches as far as it can for others. On Friday night, we prayed over a young lady who's leaving for Taiwan. And here's this young gal who knows nobody in that country. All she knows is God has called me to do this. And I love them and I want them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I just sat there marveling, going, this is just amazing. Every, all she has is a backpack now. And she just wants to tell Taiwanese of the love of God in Christ Jesus. And then she's moving. And I watched all these college kids come and sacrifice and do everything they could to get her all packed up. And the prayers they prayed over her were unbelievable. I just, I want you to see a love that stretches. It just stretches. When's the last time you stretched besides touching your toes? You know, when is the last time your love just went boom? It's the one thing. It's one thing to be nice and to help when you have a little bit of spare time. That's nice, but you know what? The world does that. So few, because God has first loved them, will just stretch and stretch in their love for one another. So I like the way that God's love stretched for us. It stretched out on a cross and died in our place. A love that will cost and sacrifice it's a love that stretches, and I, I want to press us because God has first loved us. Are you stretching your love? Are you stretching your love for the brethren, for the body of Christ? Do you, do you have any stretch marks? <laughs> Are you stretching? This should be the norm and the atmosphere and the aroma of the body of Christ, stretching fervent sacrificial love for one another. And so please hear me. I see this exploding on a daily basis. I've, I've never been happier as a pastor with the amount of love that I am watching it just come out of so many of you on a constant, continual basis. I just say, well done. Well done. I feel like Paul, though, excels still more. Uh, there is a way to excel still more. It's, it's supernatural. And it's flowing out of so many of you like a mighty river. But, but to my heart's dismay, there are some of you who are still users and you're still using the body of Christ instead of serving it. And, and all you've ever done your whole life is use or, or hide instead of stretch. You're not flowing and stretching with God's love. If you were honest with yourself, you don't even really like people. 
Because if you love them, you will stretch. It's easy to say you love people and keep them at a distance. I love everybody in India. That's easy to say, okay? But to to love the person sitting next to you, I gotta stretch. I gotta give. it It would be just such a beautiful world if there weren't people. I've heard someone say that. I've always wondered why God didn't feel that way. He created them and put them in it. You use excuses that, hear this, God's not going to agree with your excuses for why you're not loving the body. He's not going to let you have these excuses on the last day. It's the gospel setting you free to love. The other excuses, shy, it's not my gift, those are, those are lies. I want you to see that hospitality is not a gift. We're going to look at that because it says have hospitality so you can exercise your gifts. Okay? Love is not a, a gift, a spiritual gift. Every believer has it. You, you exercise it. You, so just get this. Do you know if you don't fit into a church of people who've been called out by God and joined to Jesus Christ by the grace of God, do you know what that means? The problem is you. How, how can you not love those who love Christ? We all fit in. We're all one. We're all unified. You're looking for natural things to fit, and that's not what the body of Christ is. It's supernatural. So get that off the table. If a believer, you have everything in common. And so here's what I see. And I I could be wrong. I am a lot of times. There's a group that's really getting this. And I get the privilege of being around these college and career young men and women. uh, And they're getting what it means to entrench and stretch and serve. And so you guys, you go. I'm so proud of you. You got a whole bunch of other problems. (laughs) But this you're getting. And just keep it up. It's beautiful. But there's another group that still thinks church is a place that you come to and maybe you find one little area, you do this act of service, and then you go home, and, and that's what church is. And you were taught that growing up in churches and by people. And I just, I love you, and I want you to know that isn't the Bible. That isn't true. Throw that down. Get rid of that mindset. Uh, we need to be growing in a manifested love. Um, in love, I want what Peter is calling for here in every heart, because the end's near. This is what is needed in these last days to stay awake and in the love of Christ, ready and waiting and advancing his kingdom. Peter is going to drop a little prepositional phrase now to reveal a manifestation of love that he feels is crucial for the end times kind of love that he's calling for. And I said this last week, as it heats up, so do our tempers and so do our sins and so do our frustrations. So if we're going to join together as one and show the world something supernatural in relationships that are united by Christ to be in our homes and use our gifts, we're going to need this because love covers a multitude of sins. It's in the plural. I don't just cover a sin. I cover sins. Okay, hear that. There's a big difference. I covered a sin last year. I'm I'm good for next year. Okay, it covers sins. Peter is not on an ivory tower theologian. He's living this out in his own life. He's speaking from practical experience and wisdom here. As you dig into the body and love them like this, what are you going to notice first? What are you going to notice first? This bunch isn't so lovely, is it? You look so lovely on Sunday, but when we dig in, it's not as lovely as it looks. We're prickly. We're touchy. We're easily offended. We're critical. We don't respond uh, to each other's love the way that I hoped people would. They don't reciprocate the way that they should. They can be draining. They can be obnoxious. It takes time to sanctify that out of us. We can be attacking, and the list goes on and on and on. If we're going to do this God's way, the first thing you're going to realize is that we still have remaining sin, and people are going to rub you the wrong way. That is a promise. But you see that the end is at hand And what hasn't happened yet? We haven't been perfected yet. So get real intimate and love each other. But remember, you still have remaining sin because Jesus Christ hasn't, you haven't died or he hasn't come back. Realize that as you start to engage and get into each other's lives. We're no longer in the flesh, but the flesh is still in us as even believers. 
So come together the way that God has called us to. And the first thing you will realize is that there has to be a graciousness then with each other. There needs to be a forgiving spirit. There needs to be a covering of sins. And if you don't, here is what will happen. You'll you'll, you'll pull away from people who hurt you. Or you'll pull away from people who are just flat out difficult. You'll quit talking to them. You'll just walk right by them. You'll start looking for a church who doesn't have people like this. And you're going to spend all of your days going from church to church to find a church where somebody won't hurt you. And that's called heaven. That's glory. You're always on the hunt for the church made perfect in heaven here on earth. And so I want to save you some time. They don't exist. Go read Revelation and the seven churches. Go read Corinthians and go find the perfect church. It is called heaven. So my brothers and sisters, there's a more excellent way to deal with people who are still sinners, and it's to cover a multitude of sins. Peter could have chose any aspect of love. He could have gone to the list of 1 Corinthians 13 and pulled out any one of those, but he chose this one in particular. And so what is he he getting at? Well, first, we know what he's not saying is he's not saying cover their sins in the sight of God like what Jesus did for us. He's not saying this, to wink at the sin of others and not admonish or reprove them or go to them in Matthew 18 where you confront them and sin. So that's not what he's saying. But I think he might be referring in his mind to this proverb of 17.9. It says this, he who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates intimate friends. And so you, if, if you cover transgressions, you're seeking love. This agape that we're talking about, I will, I'll cover it. But if you keep repeating and telling other people what someone did and how they treated you, you're, you're going to separate intimate friends and cause all kinds of conflicts with the chattering and the gossip. So when there's an absence of love in the heart, We're going to fasten on every sin that we see. When when you don't have love in your heart, you're just going to be a critical looking at everyone, seeing the worst, not hoping and believing. You're just going to be someone that you're you're not going to even like yourself. It's just that's what will happen. And we'll cause strife in the body and we'll repeat things and we'll gossip and we'll hurt people. And I think what Peter is saying is we all have remaining sin. We're all going to offend each other by our comments by our attitudes, and by our unloving spirits at times. But we must live together to put on display this beautiful oneness of Christ and families and forbearing and forgiving and covering sins. There's something so beautiful in this. So do we magnify every defect we see? Do we stir it up? Guys, there has to be a place that love covers John Piper said this. He said, there's times when we can't get everything resolved in the body of Christ or even in our marriages or even with our kids. Uh, He said, in a marriage, there's times you can talk and talk and try to see each other's view and you never come to the place where you see each other's point of view and you're hurt and you can't get it resolved. He says, what do you do? Love covers. And hear this and it never got resolved. Love can actually cover without a perfect resolution. Have you ever had that in the body where you can't get it worked out and you can't understand each other and you can't see and and love is just gonna have to cover it or you can be bitter and avoid and do all the other things the rest of your days where you're just avoiding each other now because you couldn't get it worked out because you couldn't see it the same way. Time will show, uh, one, the sin or the attitude uh, that we can't get at now. Maybe even let it work out. Maybe it won't get worked out till glory. But until then, love covers a multitude of sin. And catch this, not your own. Love doesn't cover your own sin. It covers others' sin. Do you put a magnifying glass on the brethren? Do you love to get something on someone? You have to prove that you're right in your own assessment of their sin. You're quick to see it in others and you're slow to see their graces. When I see sin in others as we rub shoulders and get into each other's homes now and lives, 
Am I excited to throw a cover over their sins and know that as they journey in grace, God will grow and transform these sins and these weaknesses? Guys, you will see a multitude of each other's sins in real vital fellowship. Living stones interconnected in the, with the cornerstone. When we are not plastic saints, when we quit faking that all is perfect and not being just hypocritical, we're going to see sins in each other. And fervent love will joyfully cover them as we stay in unity and harmony for the, the thing that's greater than us, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and his glory. I pray that you're hearing this and genuine fellowship and oneness will be preserved by confronting one another in sin, repenting and forgiving and moving on as if it never happened. But also there's a time where just love covers sins. A healthy body has to have both. And, and that doesn't mean sweep it under the rug. It means to cover it, to just cover it. How do I do that? How do I just cover when I'm wronged and when I'm hurt, frustrated in a marriage and I just can't get through it, how do I do this with a kid and we just can't see eye to eye with a teenager? I have more sin in me than I'm even aware of. My heart, I've said this before, it's like a sponge with black ink and every once in a while God rings it to just show me what's really inside of my heart. I'm aware of this. And my whole relationship with God is that my sins, not in part but the whole, have been nailed to the cross and I bear them no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. My sins have been covered. I dwell in a perfect relationship with God as one who still sins. God, may I reflect that kind of love to my brethren that I have to live in on a daily basis. And so I wish that Peter would have just laid out a list for us when to confront, when to take a speck out of a brother's eye, and when to just cover a sin of my brother or sister. But he doesn't give us that list. So we need the Spirit, we need the Word, and we need each other to keep working this out together in body life. But in these end days, we need a love like this for each other in a world that covers nothing a world that ends relationships with any defect that they see in us. I've never seen a meaner, more hostile world in my days. What goes on on social media is unbelievable. And they cover nothing. Some of you young kids, you know when you go to school, there's just people who are mean and nasty and they cover none of our defects. They just lift them up and shoot them. That's what this world is. May we be countercultural in the body of Christ in these last days because of the grace of God in us where we love fervently and we cover each other's sins. You can't get that anywhere else. And may we put that on display and show the beauty of the body of Christ being like Christ. And so maybe my question for you to spend time with God this day is maybe ask yourself, do I ever confront a brother or sister in sin uh, that's not loving. You need to confront your brothers and sisters to help them grow and be sanctified. And the next question is, do you ever cover a sin? And if you don't, that's not loving. If there's not some kind of beautiful balance that God's growing and working in you, you're out of balance and you're not manifesting what Peter's talking about here. So does the truth that Christ is coming soon for the consummation of all things make you shrink back? Oh God, don't come back. I've got to clean up my life. Or does it make you smile with joy that your lover is coming for you and that makes your heart want to spend and be spent and loving for the brethren and the lost? He's coming back. I just want to love. I'm just the love machine. I want to love God and I want to love others. He's coming back. Let that stir something. Start living this way and many will glorify God on the day of their visitation because of our excellent behavior. And they will see the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness unto his marvelous light. Amen? I just get excited at what this could be. And we're, we're getting there. We're growing. We just have to excel still more. And I believe the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. They will be, Paul said in Romans 1, they're all hearing about your faith all over the world because it's manifesting itself in love. 
And I just pray that this will touch the world as we behold this gospel and love one another like no other place. It's supernatural and many will be saved and ask us what's the hope within us. So if you are visiting this morning and you are seeing a love that is just you can't find in this world, I want you to come talk to me after the service and I'll tell you how to get this love because the love of God sent his son into this world to die in a cross in our place. It's the foundation of all that we are. Let's go to God and pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you that Peter is just guiding us so sweetly in these end days, the last days of the last days we can sense. Lord, I pray that we will be growing in a fervent love for one another. God, give us the ability to cover sin instead of exalting it, spreading it, hurting. God, let us be blankets just covering sin uh, as a body so that you will get all the glory. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.